far as this, this non-interference with the testing party's activity, because that's why you're there, to measure the yield, no other reason. And measure the yield, maybe that's a, an oversimplification. In the case of the Threshold Test Ban Treaty and the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty, it's not exactly to me measure the yield, it's to assure ourselves that 150 kilotons has not been exceeded. Jordan Heston. I'd like to tell you about something that took place a while ago at uh, the Nevada test site where the United States does its underground nuclear testing. Our nuclear scientists performed an experiment there that nobody thought was possible. But first, let's go all the way back to the beginning. That's nearly 40 years ago now. I was in the Army Air Corps getting ready for the invasion of Japan, Operation Coronet, they called it. They predicted one million U.S. casualties. It had never happened. It wasn't necessary. Something incredible happened out in the deserts of New Mexico. Trinity, first atomic test. Well, not long after that, the Japanese surrendered, and I came home. Then I uh, parted the Red Sea, won a chariot race, and took care of a couple of other odds and ends, but that's another story. For a while, the United States was the only nuclear power on Earth, but other nations were anxious to develop their own nuclear capabilities. First Russia, then the United Kingdom, then France, and China, and India. The nuclear race had begun. Testing went on in remote areas all over the world, always in utmost secrecy. Since the 40s, the words atomic and secret are often found together. And it's no wonder. A nation's nuclear strength is often the crucial element in its total military security. And so for more than 40 years, nuclear testing has continued, always in secret. Political paranoia? No, I, I don't think so. The nuclear secrets are real, the threats to national security are real, and the stakes are as high as they can get. Everything that counts. In 1963, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom all agreed that it was important to eliminate radioactive fallout from the world's atmosphere. Testing went underground, this time literally. Since that time, U.S. research teams have worked far from sight in the desert basins of Nevada. The uh, Russians work in uh, several remote places. One of them is uh, Semipolatinsk in Kazakhstan. Over the years, both nations have developed their own procedures for drilling, in placing test devices and for gathering important information from their tests. Information like a test device's actual nuclear yield as compared to calculations. Nuclear yield is measured in tons of TNT needed to produce the same result. For a time, the United States and Russia tested devices with huge yields, equivalent to millions of tons or megatons of TNT.
For technical reasons, more recent tests have had little reason to exceed yields of 150,000 tons or kilotons of TNT. Of greater importance, in the mid-1970s, both nations saw the practical advantages of limiting tests to a maximum 150 kiloton yield. Two treaties were written, the Threshold Test Ban Treaty of 1974 and the Peaceful Nuclear Explosions Treaty of 1976. Both were signed, but for a number of reasons, they were never ratified. Soon, we suspected that our verification technology was inadequate, and we knew the Russians were no better off. They repeatedly accused the United States of violating treaty limits, and we weren't. Their verification procedures were giving them inaccurate readings. Something had to be done. First, both sides had to develop new verification methods. Then work out a way to cross-check the new U.S. and Soviet techniques. We also had to start building the trust needed to make treaties work better. The U.S. felt both these aims could be achieved if observers were allowed on-site during tests. But how do you reach agreement on such a sensitive issue? An idea lay waiting in an old Russian proverb. Dobryayim, no probryayim. Trust, but verify. In 1987, President Reagan mentioned the old Russian saying to Chairman Gorbachev during their summit, and he made sure that Mr. Gorbachev got the message. This treaty transcends numbers. We have listened to the wisdom of, in an old Russian maxim, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. The maxim is, dovayai no provayai, trust but verify. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev got the message. <laughs> the new, almost unbelievable exercise in Soviet American cooperation began to take shape. A long history of superpower mistrust and confrontation was turned on its ear by two world leaders with the courage to make things happen. In May of 1988, U.S. Secretary of State George Shultz met in Moscow with Soviet Foreign Minister Edvard Shevardnadze. Together, they signed an historical document, the Joint Verification Experiment Agreement. Two nuclear devices would be detonated, one in the United States, the other in the Soviet Union, each under the direct scientific observation of the other's team on site. Not only would the secret nuclear test sites open their doors to one another, the scientists would be encouraged to maintain close contact during the sensitive business of yield analyses. The goal, after years of developing separate technologies, would be to avoid misunderstandings that would put the treaties at risk. Both nations would have the assurance that treaties could be made and signed, but above all, verified. Trust is a tree from which the branches of cooperation grow. In the world of test negotiations, verification technology is the root system that anchors that tree in reality. As the leaders of the United States and the USSR agreed in Moscow in December of 1987, Dovryai, no proveryai, trust but verify. <laughs> this is a softball game, nothing special. Softball goes on all summer all over America, but this fella looks a little confused. Not too surprising when you realize he probably never saw a softball or a bat before in his life. They don't play softball in Moscow. Now, Cheryl, come to me, Cheryl. Keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on, keep on. And even if they did, these fellas probably wouldn't try out for the team. They're nuclear scientists. But that's not the only strange thing about this game. In fact, there's almost nothing normal about it. The other players are American nuclear scientists, and this isn't Helsinki or Sarajevo or some other international sports stadium. This is Mercury, 
headquarters of the super-secret Nevada test site. And this game is inside the security fence. A half-hour drive north from this ball game, deep within the Nevada test site, is the CP complex, nerve center for United States underground nuclear testing. From the CP, high on a saddle between two desert basins, you can see great distances. Fifteen miles across shimmering hot Frenchman flat. To the northeast, another 15 miles across Yucca flat. CP can tune its electronic ears to any place in the range. Soon, it'll establish contact with a site in the mountains to the northwest, known as Area 19, scheduled for a very special event, codename Kearsarge, but more of that later. Yucca Flat, Frenchman Flat, only a few people have seen them since the test range was established, but the names are familiar. These, as some of the scientists sometimes say, are the valleys where the giant mushrooms grew. Even nuclear detonations are dwarfed by the huge expanses of the Nevada test site, as big as the whole state of Rhode Island. All the testing's underground today, as it has been since 1963. Only the pockmarked desert testifies to the power of the devices detonated here, thousands of feet below the surface. In January 1988, the first Soviet officials came to Nevada. They got a taste of U.S. cafeteria food. Then they settled in for their first night in U.S. Department of Energy housing. Over the next few days, there was a great deal of speech making, handshaking, and toasting. Then they went home. In June, they came back. It's time to work. After another short ceremony, of course, this one at Area 19. Uh, perhaps a year ago, none of us would expect that something of this nature would happen. Uh, The 
The Russian equipment trailer had already arrived at Mercury. It was waiting for them, safe and sound, under lock and key. At nearby Indian Springs, the American trailers were loaded onto an Air Force C-5A. Destination, Semipalatinsk, Kazakhstan, USSR. Los Alamos National Laboratory's Don Eilers is the technical man behind Cortex, the U.S. verification system. instrument that is being used, proposed by the United States to uh, verify the yields of underground nuclear explosions. In principle, Cortex is easy enough to understand. A cable is run down the hole with a nuclear explosive or down a nearby satellite hole. An electronic signal is sent down the cable and bounced back to the Cortex equipment. There, the signal's round trip time is measured and the exact length of the cable is determined from that. In a nuclear test, as the shock wave from the blast advances, it crushes the cortex cable, causing the electronic signal to make shorter and shorter round trips. Cortex equipment translates these changes in round trip times into a picture of the advancing shock wave, how fast it's moving. And from that, the scientists can determine the nuclear yield of the detonation. What we are seeing this morning is an assembly of the equipment that is required to sustain our operation in the Soviet Union. Uh, the time schedule is such that uh, it needs to leave uh, the United States tomorrow morning to accommodate uh, a mid to late September uh, event at the Semipolitans. That's good. That's good. The next morning, the U.S. advance team boards the huge transport plane. Eilers and others will follow after the test in Nevada. First stop, Frankfurt, then Moscow, then on to Kazakhstan and the Soviet test site at Semipolatinsk. Back at Mercury, the Soviet trailer is loaded onto a truck and hauled 30 miles across the desert to Area 19. Ball games only take place in the evenings and then only as a break from more important matters like seminars. Both scientific teams take turns briefing one another on their own verification technology. The Soviets have a yield measurement system called MIZ, M-I-Z. It operates very much like the American Cortex system. Electronic signals bounce back and forth and are interpreted at the surface in terms of shock wave behavior. The signals will be read here, near ground zero in the Russian trail. Several hundred feet away, near the shot hole, the Soviet scientists are installing a second yield measurement system. It uses a string of downhole switches. The switches close one after another as the shock front reaches them. The progress of the shock wave and the yield of the detonation are calculated much as with MIZ and Cortex. During the Kearsarge event, the Russians intend to use both MIZ and the switches with which they've had more experience. Back at Mercury, there's a meeting every day at 3 p.m. sharp to make sure everyone understands what is expected of everybody. This is Professor Viktor Nikitovich Mikhailov, head of the Institute of Earth Physics of the USSR Academy of Sciences. The mood is mostly serious here. Terms of the Geneva Agreements are often examined for technical on-the-job practicality. Most problems are solved in this room. A few take phone calls around the world.
For example, Professor Mikhailov reminds everyone that procedures agreed in Geneva require that the empty container for the nuclear device be weighed, the bottom filled with garnet sand, and then weighed again. The Americans agreed that those procedures were indeed specified in Geneva and complied. This is Professor Mikhailov again, this time at ground zero. He's on top of the sand-filled container, checking to be sure that the scales are working and can detect his added weight. Doveryai, no proveryai. Trust, but verify. Professor Mihailov insisted on wearing his lucky hat. Since Nevada test site safety rules require hard hats, he decided to wear both, one on top of the other. The words in the hard hat are accurate, even if they weren't Victor's specific choice. Days pass. Meetings follow meetings. Measurements are made, cables checked, instruments adjusted. Finally, it's the evening before shot day. All the machinery, superstructures, and equipment have been removed from ground zero. All that's left is an innocent-looking assembly of pipe, concrete, and cable. On the other end of this cable, however, is the Kearsarge device, designed to explode with a force of more than 100,000 tons of TNT. On the surface end, or rather ends, are the scientific trailers. From this position, the Americans are to the right, the Russians to the left. A crow in a nearby tree is due for a big surprise if he decides to sit around till morning. Or maybe not, if we listen to Viktor Mihailov. With a twinkle in his eye, Viktor suggested that a vodka bottle be placed on top of the hole to see if the American bomb is powerful enough to knock it over. After which I proposed to our U.S. colleagues that we leave that bottle of vodka uh, at the top of the hole. To see that it still is there uh, after the conduct of the experiment. <laughs> uh, needless to say, this is a joke. Uh -huh. <laughs> Finally, it's shot day. Everyone's up long before sunrise. There's a sense of excitement in the pre-dawn quiet of the Nevada desert. Officials have gathered from everywhere. The departments of energy, defense, and state, as well as the arms control and disarmament agency, arms negotiators from Geneva, Russian scientists, and Russian military. You have to remember, the Russian test site and their nuclear test program are operated by their military, not by a civilian agency as it is in the United States. The mixed group of Americans and Soviets arrive at the control center. They'll be here during the detonation. The countdown proceeds.
Kearsarge is history. The first nuclear test observed directly on U.S. soil by scientists from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The test is a complete success, technically and politically. Don Eilers gives us the high sign. Cortex has done its job. Word comes over the radio that the Russian instruments have too. The Nevada test site, always a beehive of activity, is alive now with a special kind of excitement. The people who measure nuclear capabilities for their countries on both sides of the world have had a chance to work together as colleagues. The actual nuclear yield of Kearsarge will be calculated by both the Soviets and the Americans from their own measurements and compared. Treaty negotiators will have a better chance of reaching realistic agreements with more open technical exchanges a reality. So mutual respect and understanding has been achieved. We hope that'll increase and mature with the second joint test in Russia and beyond. Two men met. Both were able to talk because both were strong. Both were able to listen for the same reason. On September 13th, 1988, the countdown began for the second event, codenamed Shagan. At 9 p.m. Nevada time, Shagan became history with Kearsarge. Step two in a bold new approach to the solution of formidable problems. No briyai, no probriyai. Trust, but verify. I'm Charlton Heston.